I'm David Bogod. I, I used to be a consultant here many years ago, and occasionally they get me out of mothballs, uh, uh, give me a shot of adrenaline, and send me up on stage. Uh, and, and here we all are. Um, so uh, welcome to you all. Many thanks for attending. Um, uh, as ever, uh, microphones won't be switched on in the room. Um, if, uh, so if you've got any questions in the room, don't join the Zoom. Raise your hands for questions. If you are on Zoom, please ask questions via the chat option. Uh, we have two speakers for you in this session, and the first I'm very pleased to announce indeed is Dr. Colonel VJ Dutter. Uh, now, VJ has had 34 years of experience as being, in being employed with the Indian Army Medical Corps as a physician and pulmonologist. Uh, during his tenure with the armed forces, he had an opportunity to work in the insurgency areas in Sri Lanka, Jammu and Kashmir. In addition, he's worked in active management of military casualties coming from the Siachen Glacier. He's been working at the Indian Spinal Injuries Center, ISIC, in Delhi for the last five years, a tertiary level center for all patients with spinal injuries in India. Uh, and uh, Vijay is going to give us a talk about uh, PTSD, uh, a survivor's story. So thank you very much for coming to this country, Vijay. Good evening, everybody. At the outset, I would like to thank the organizer and especially my friend Sandeep for giving this opportunity to come and visit the UK. Uh, actually, after the medical school, I had joined uh, Indian Army as a young medical officer. So I had opportunity to serve in the conflict immediately after having undergone a training for two months where we teach us how to do parade, how to operate weapons, in addition to what we learn in our medical school. So practically, in two months' time, I do not know how much I knew how to handle weapons and all that, and immediately you are inducted into the active ops. So I really was fortunate to survive as I'm standing in front of you, not only from the physical trauma and from the mental trauma as well. Subsequently, I did my two degrees, that is first internal medicine, later pulmonology, and later I worked as both intensivist uh, and pulmonologist in the Indian Army. So, this is what is the knowledge of medical traumas and injuries in the war I'll be talking of, and my experience, especially in Indo-Sri Lankan conflict, which goes back to 87, 89. So uh, this contains a personal view. I am not in receipt of any monetary benefit from any organization. Just to give you a brief background, the Tamilians were taken as the laborer to work in uh, the uh, plantation which was tea plantation which was planted in Sri Lanka sorry and they moved from Tamil Nadu there is no point okay so basically, they moved from Tamil Nadu uh, to the northeastern part of Sri Lanka, where the tea plantation was done by the Britishers, and they were to work as the laborer. So initially, those Tamilians were minorities, they were illiterate, and gradually over a period of time, they became more literate, and they rather migrated even to UK, and they were the main funder of this uh, liberation tiger of Tamil Ilam, because once they became more uh, you can say economically more viable society in Senhali's state. Which Senhala is the basically Buddhist community, which is the majority in Sri Lanka. And they wanted to dominate them, and that is how the conflict started. That is the background. So this is actually the paper which was signed by Indian Governor General at that time, under which this migration had occurred way back. Uh, when Britishers were uh, sort of in whole command of India, some continent. 
So I was part of the Gorkha rifles. Even among these Gorkhas are a few of one royal uh, Gorkhas are guarding the Buckingham Palace as well. So I was part of this Gorkha rifle regiment. So one infantry regiment, just to give you a background, being medicals, you may not be knowing that we have 1,000 active bodied men, including officer, which is commanding by a colonel level officer. I was just a young captain with one year of service, I joined them. And it is divided into four rifle companies. The one rifle company is commanded by one major rank officer, and they have around 100 men each into each section. So that is around 300 men actively participating in the active operation. So this uh, operation was planned from 1st to 4th of March, and it was basically a high-risk search and destroy mission. So if you see uh, on, up on the north, uh, on the east side is the Bay of Bengal, and the Nehru Lagoon was the target area. And we knew that the main libra liberation tiger, Tamil Ilam, the main uh, that Prabhakran and Mahatya, who are later killed by Sri Lankan forces later on, after we left around 10, 12 years later. So they were actually having actual camps in, if you see the park country area, which is marked, and our battalion headquarter was up in Kumla Manai, which you can see. We were to come down to park country on foot. So practically we marched in night after the sunset or after the last light with the help of my commanding officer, around three JCOs and 111 OVAs. That was the active force and two stops were made with one officer and almost 90 jawan guarding the both sides of the lagoon. This is the broader view or this is how the force was to move from uh, the main battalion headquarter to the park country region. So this is how the terrain, the panoramic view of the terrain which I have taken photograph from the chopper myself after that debacle. I was told to point where I have the casualties had happened and all that. So this is actual photograph which I have taken from the chopper myself. And this is how the terrain you can appreciate uh, looks like from the helicopter. So we were basically three officers, five JCOs and 111 ORs as I mentioned earlier. And we had these many number of people. So I was the medical officer. And in addition, we had uh, two battlefield nursing assistants. That means two male nurses, which we have trained uh, to give some sort of uh, basic medical aid at the site of injury. The first of March was the start of operation. The second March, we searched and destroyed. And third March, the main battle started. The moment we made contact with the uh, camps, we were surrounded by a 270 degree arch by the LTT. And we had 10 people dead at the moment. My task was immediately to retrieve those dead and dying casualties immediately in, in the bargain for one patient or one of my comrade, I had to put in a chest tube drain at the, in the battlefield itself. And gradually we evacuated. I used to have pockets full of pathogen morphine, like you were saying that this sort of morphine and pathogen analgesia is not good. But my personal experience was that it is tremendously, it helped the people who are riddling with pain because of the gunshot or mind blast injuries. So 4th of March was the retreat. The variety of war injuries, I will just show you the photographs which I have taken myself. So this sort of blast injuries which used to happen, mind blast, and this is the facial wound uh, which one of our jawans uh, underwent, and this is post recovery after the surgery, the plastic surgery, the jawan came back to our battalion. You can see the various karma, he lost one eye as well. 
So these are the one of our Johnny who lost both of his limb by mind blast. Both the legs were blown off. This is another Jawan who uh, had uh, injury to the foot. The forefoot was totally blown off. Fortunately, it could be reconstructed by our plastic surgeon later on. This is how the reconstruction used to happen by the surgeons. And this is one of the photograph. Uh, this is not an actual photo. This is a gunshot wound of the chest. So this is how the bullet injury of the leg with the AK-47 used to look like. So in the bargain, we lost one officer, two JCOs, 25 Jawan killed on 3rd of March, uh, 1989 itself. And we had uh, three JCOs and 30 Jawan injured in the bargain. So we were uh, duly awarded uh, with gallantry award one Mahavir Chakra to VRCs by the President of India. And uh, in total, if you see, during nearly two and a half year of uh, Indian peacekeeping mission in Sri Lanka, the Indian Army suffered to the tune of 1,200 killed uh, casualties. And at the de-induction was completed by December 1989. And which was uh, prior to that, was the lot of other conflicts had happened and finally it culminated in the assassination of our then uh, Prime Minister Mr. Rajiv Gandhi during the election campaign in Tamil Nadu on 21st May. So there are various uh, studies which were conducted uh, you can say on PTSD by various uh, authors from Jaffna University so this is one of the uh, study so and various other studies if you can uh, look into the slide so basically they have depicted that how much the civilian not only the veterans or the army personnel had undergone and they basically did all transactional study to know what was the prevalence of ptsd among the general public as well so this is one of the slide if you see this is a actual, uh, you can say the uh, depiction which is given to a small child to narrate what was the actual uh, experience. So this is the diagram which a child drew. This is the hut, the bullet are being fired. It is all written in Tamil. And then they are getting displays, people are running away and all houses are now empty. So this shows that people have died people are dying and that is how the trauma has occurred to a even small child. This is how uh, the dead bodies in the civilians used to be lined up because of mass casualties being uh, sustained by the, uh, you can say the civilians on the account of uh, uh, Sri Lankan army. And this is how the, uh, they used to be clamped together, the, all these civilians separately from the uh, battle casualties. So basically, how to heal uh, from the psychological and mental trauma is a big uh, challenge for the, not only for the actual combatant, and it is including for the civilian, where the actual war happens. So basically, there are various intervention for the recovery and regeneration, which should be multi-sectorial, and the discourse complicates that what allowed can be done. So he was one of our, uh, one bad senior to us. He actually died. He was medical officer, like me only. Unfortunately, he passed away, Dr. Ashwini Kumar Kanwa. He died uh, during active ops in Sri Lankan operation. He is one of the few doctors who lost his life in Sri Lankan operations. So this is the book which my brigade commander had written, which mentions my name because I was unfortunately being a medical officer was sidelined for citation for uh, the gallantry award. So in that he does mention about my name that what I was not to reason why. So that is just to show you that people do remember us 
even if they do not uh, tell us at the face value that yes, we did something good for them at the active operation. So same thing got repeated during uh, COVID times after a gap of 36 years. I was in charge of uh, COVID management in our center. Of course, it is a tertiary level center hospital for exclusively for spine injured, high paraplegic, quadriplegic. So during COVID time, all 200 beds were converted by government of Delhi uh, orders to become a COVID hospital. So I, being a physician and pulmonologist, made in charge of these uh, things. So this is on the right hand side of the slide. I am uh, fully decked up into the PP, which I used to wear uh, for nearly eight to 10 hours every day, taking morning rounds. And this is our whole team. And on the top most slide, uh, on the left hand side, you can see our n nursing in charge who had severe COVID, had to be put on non-invasive ventilation, and ultimately, fortunately, came out. These are various how our ICU and other uh, HDU unit used to look like. And this is how we used to take ward round every day and used to be awfully busy during COVID times. This is nothing new for all uh, critical care anesthetists, just to show that we were also faced the same trauma as all over the world people face because of the COVID. So just to give you brief overview, I won't bore you with this slide. I will just skip through. The criteria are well known. It can be acute or chronic. And uh, these symptoms are also that recurrent intrusive distressing recollection of the event. It can be psychological distress to exposure of the things that symbolizes or resembles the aspects of trauma, including anniversaries thereof. This is important. And inability to outburst of anger, inability, irritability can progress to a rage even. In my case, I was so depressed that for one month I could not eat food after Sri Lankan, uh, you can say the, uh, this thing, uh, conflict. The bullet had passed over my buttocks. I was just praying to God, please save me. I am licensed to save, not licensed to kill. Fortunately, they did not touch me. There was a one bomb which landed next to me as our chairperson is sitting. So fortunately, that also did not burst on 3rd of March 1989. And as this LA of uh, staircases there, one more last bomb landed next to me which did not burst. So after that, the flight and flight phenomena came in. My heart started thumping and I started running away from the area where all people were dead except myself. And LTT thought that I am also one among the dead. That's how they stopped firing at me. So I was lucky to survive. I remained three days without water, without compass, without map. And fortunately for me, I came out after 72 hours and brought back three walking wounded along. So how to do have avoidance of feature? So you avoid activities which make you recollect or situations thereof, inability to recall the important aspects of the trauma that is known as psychological amnesia, and markedly diminished interest in the significant activity, feeling of detachment from the others. The classical signs are well known, which can be overcommitment beginning of exhaustion, increasing exhaustion, and feeling burned out. This all we have faced during COVID times as well. And these are what self-care will look like for you, that you should have self-compassion, reframing, gratitude and appreciation, humor, financial goal, time for yourself, adequate amount of sleep, good food, and aligning with your values. Now, this is just a brain, how you must train your brain, how to contain your emotion. This slide just depicts that. That if you have uh, on top is the anchor of the attention, you have to make to your breath. You have to basically control the breath. This is what the yoga teaches us. And this I practiced during uh, COVID time. 
I used to get up early in the morning, do yoga and pranayama. So this helps definitely, there is no doubt about it. So the benefits of meditation is that primary health benefit from the meditation practice appears to be general shift of an autonomic nervous system that decreases the sympathetic uh, tone and increases the parasympathetic tone. And the parasympathetic system is stimulated. It sort of controls the heart rate. Breathing becomes slow and shallow. The stress hormones, they decrease, the blood vessel dilate, and the digestion is facilitated. It helps in depression, anxiety, sleep, improves the immune function, improves the cortisol level, decision making, and coping up with the distress psychologically. So at the end, may you be happy, may you be healthy, may you be free from internal and external harm, may you experience love, joy and wonder just as it is. May you have ease of the day. Thank you. And just to conclude, I just wanted to give an overview of Sri Lankan operation and share my own experience which I incurred. Any questions are welcome. Thank you so much, uh, Vijay, for sharing your experience.